Kia ora tata. it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to speak to you about a joint mapping project between Melbourne District Council and NIWA that we undertook in May this year. This joint project came out of uh, the Davidson Report in 2011, looking at marine significant sites, and it identified a marine significant site that hadn't previously been surveyed. So it was a good uh, baseline test case to look at how NIWA could engage with Melbourne District Council in the marine significant sites program. Now what we're using is multi-beam mapping. So the first thing um, I'm going to show is actually what multi-beam mapping means. So basically we see the fan of sound, 800 beams of sound down from a hull mounted sounder. It pops down and we get sound returns that come back to us. So unlike other mapping techniques where you get a single ping down and a single ping back, we put down a fan of sound. We return all the angular incidents of that sound over a big strip of seafloor. So we get 100% coverage. We can map 100% of the seafloor with this uh, fan of sound, 800 beams of sound going down and back to us. It also, with the physics of sound, we can look at things like not only just the speed that the sound returns, but we can look at the strength of the sound that comes back, which can give us a lot of details about actually what the substrate is that that sound is hitting and returning from. So that was actually a model of our Tangaroa, but um, a little bit big to use for the, the survey we did here. We used the US intro vessel, the Ikateri. It's a catamaran. We have an M2040, that's the latest generation of multi-beam uh, mounted on the Ikateri. And uh, a feature that is important is it's a retractable pole mount. Probably doesn't make um, much sense, but when you've got a million dollars of kit hanging out beneath you, you certainly don't want to transit through the oceans for 30 knots while that's suspended below you. So we can retract it to transit, and we can put it down to survey at six to eight knots survey speed. So what um, um, scale can you, can you map with this? Um, so the resolution of our scale, that comes resolution. resolution. So the resolution comes down to your transceiver and, and uh, transponder and receiver system. NIWA has purchased what's called a 0.4 and a 0.7. What does that mean? That's the angle that we send beams down. So we send them down at 0.4 degrees and we can pick them up from a range of 0.7 degrees. That means at the moment this is the highest resolution system on the market. The uh, flume test with this is a 16 centimetre box cell size that we can manage with the system. Obviously you need to understand that's in perfect North Sea conditions. It's not quite like that around New Zealand's oceans, so we tend to market it at a 50 centimetre resolution for this kind of gear. You get really good days and you get a lot of better resolution. And also we have this set in a range of frequencies. So what I was talking about there is just your average survey, the middle frequency range, 300 frequency kilohertz. You can get that kind of 50 centimetre resolution, a very wide distance of seafloor and a good depth range that we can use this kit over. We can modify it and we can push it to 400 kilohertz. That means we can actually get a far higher resolution out of the system. And again, we have what's called a dual swap. That means we get 800 pings per fan. We can turn that on and off or we can slow our transit speed and so we can actually play with resolution that way as well. And the other advantage of this system is, what, is we record water column data. So sound is going through the water, it's not a direct down and back, you have anything in the water, a change in temperature, scald of fish, uh, gas bubbles coming up, that's going to scatter your signal, and so we're now recording what we call the scatterers, so we can start getting information from the water column. So to cut to the chase, what were we tasked to do? It was uh, submarine significant site 2.3, this is a pre-survey, um, this is based on satellite gravity imagery that NIWA grids up. Um, and there's the boundaries of site 2.3 were basically derived from limited historical information from commercial fishers and a single scientific mention of a site actually just further to the south here that has um, been known to have 63 species of rhizoa present in it. We're just going to straight to the final product here. This is your product after we've been through with the multi-beam mapping. This is a 10 metre grid we've put across uh, over 100 square kilometres of sea floor. 200 million soundings have been returned to generate this product. And obviously we can see we've got a significant change in the depth and the shape of the sea floor that we've been able to reveal. 
those scatterers I said coming back, we can map those scatterers from the seafloor. It's called backscatter. And that gives us information on the type of the bottom it's hit. If it's hit something soft, obviously our return is a lot weaker. If we hit something hard, it returns back to us a lot faster. And so we can characterise this as sediment soft, likely to be muddy, fine-grained sediment, or is it hard, coarse cobbles? Generically in this region, we get a lot of the white-grey um, returns that indicate to us that we're looking at a coarse, uh, hard substrate inside 2.3. An example of the water column data, just on the top, that's from Tangaroa, who has been collecting water column data for a few years. That just shows how we generate a fan over the seafloor, and we have a fan in the other dimension of the water column. And this is an example here, actually from the Mobile District Council survey, where you can see the green speckles in the water column, that's the scatterers, and in actual fact, we see schools of fish coming back from the water column data. Many of you living here will know you're in an energetic tidal setting in the Greater Cook Strait region. This is just looking at the, what's called the M2 tide, so that's your ebb and flow of tides on your 12 hourly cycle. And the bright colours here around the headlands, this is the narrows um, of the North Island, and sitting around the headlands, and particularly not here, the headlands of Derby or Stewart Island. There's a, a full depth average of close to one metre per second transport around these promontories or headlands. And this is very key when you look at what we've mapped here, where the blue is deep, we've got depressions or holes. So what does that mean? This is just a, this is a tidal model where you can see um, just the movement of the arrows on the screen as your ebb and flow, and the colours are showing you the magnitude. And what we're seeing is where we see um, this ebb and flow of the tides is also the period that can stretch. You've got your deep sea depressions here, your erosion, and the material that's um, being winnowed out from there is all your fine grain material and it's leaving behind your coarse gravels. So let's look closer into some of these. This is an example of what we're calling a seafloor depression. Stevens Hole is a big one to the north of Stevens Island you may be familiar with. What we've mapped in here is, is depressions within depressions, if that makes sense. You can see you've got this depression here. It's actually sitting inside a larger eroded seafloor depression. Why is that happening? Well, it actually happens to be just offshore from Stephen's Passage. As your currents are energised, exaggerated through this passage, they pop out and touch bottom just here, erode the depression further, and then they continue with their flow around the corner. We take all this data and we turn it into a lot of other products. So this product over here is just looking at the slope. So that's the angle of the sea floor as opposed to the depth. And just what that's highlighting there is where you see the red, that's a high angle of sea floor around these sea floor depressions. Scale is very hard when we take the water off. So just an example here of profiles across this small sea floor depression here. It is actually up to a kilometre long and it is about 40 metres deep. What I've shown you here is imagery of what the sea floor potentially looks like in these depressions in site 2.3. This imagery is supplied by uh, the Bed Biogenic Habitats Program, which is funded by MPI and Oceans 2020. And these are sites to the south here. And what they're showing you is you've got a lag gravel occurring. And the far picture is actually showing a really important image for this piece of work. It's showing you a developing invertebrate landscape. It's got great species richness, and you're seeing in there encrusting bryozoans, sponges, sea stars, opioids. So there's a lot of um, species richness in this environment. Then we're just going to move on and look at another feature which was actually fascinating to us as geologists. This has only been seen once before, slightly further out in Cook Strait, and it hasn't actually been described in the literature, apart from its occurrence. It's what we call strike ridges. These are hard ridges in the seafloor. You might have seen them walking around your coastline, when you walk around rocky coastlines, you see hard ridges of rock standing up from the coastline. This is exactly the same type of feature. You've got hard ridges of New Zealand's basement rock standing up, and as the ebb and flow of your tides go back and forth across it, they erode and move all the fine sands and gravels and leave this prominent ridge. Again, for scale, the features that are about 
700 metres to a kilometre long. They stick above the bottom of the sea for about 30 metres. They've got, in red here, very steep slopes, up to 80 degrees of slope. And this new coloured image over here that we haven't seen before is what we call roughness. So how rough is the sea floor? And where it's red or high, that shows we've got a very rough or very complex piece of sea floor. And so we can see the tops of these ridges, these hard, indurated bits of basement New Zealand that are sticking out, are very complex in terms of the roughness or velocity. And that's usually where you'll find high ecological diversity. It's where you've got rough, complex sea floor. It's actually full of fascinating pictures as a geologist here. Um, if we move further north, you'll see those spiny ridges across the seafloor, sediment waves. If you just think when you walk along the beach, all your sand dunes, this is what you're seeing here under the seafloor. To give you a sense of scale though, these dunes are over 10 metres high and they're crest to crest space between each dune is between 200 to 400 metres. So they're exceptionally large features on your seafloor. And they're absolutely fascinating in this region because they show the interplay of your flood and your ebb tide. The sediment grains will run up the shallow slide of a dune and drop down the steep side. So we can see in the south, we're seeing our tides in this direction, and the sediment wave field in the north, we're seeing the flood tide come in this direction. Sorry for anyone, uh, these colours, we use a lot of reds and greens in the thymetry. But if you can see here, this is what we call aspect, or which direction is a piece of sea floor facing. So just to highlight that point to the north, the blue here, that facing to your west, and here you see the steep side is facing more to your northeast. That's not all in the system though. We've got a lot of features stacked one on top of each other in terms of, here, of the sediment waves. Sitting on top of those large features are what we call mega ripples. They're features which are about one metre high, about 10 metres spacing crest to crest. And there's a lot of complexity. That's what all these images here are showing you. This is backscatter, this is your roughness, this is your steepness and your aspect. You've got a lot of complexity on the sea floor there as you've got these ripples marching across these big sand dunes. And then on top of those ripples, shown here in this undersea photograph, for scale that bar is only 20 centimetres. So on top of those ripples we've got a third set of features and they're only about 10 centimetres apart and only several centimetres high. And this is fine sands that are rippling backwards and forwards across these features as well. And you'll have seen these all when you walk along the beach, they're exactly the same feature. And what you can see living there, a little starfish has to peek in, there's a hermit crab. We're seeing uh, creatures and vertebrates living here that like moving, flushing, Here's another example of an image from a sediment wave field and you can see down the troughs broken shell hash and that's often what you'll see in that you'll see your coarse grains down in the troughs where the water is flowing over it and you'll see your moving fine grains coming across in the ripples on the top. Now disturbed sea floor, this is natural disturbance. Uh, it's uh, disturbed sea floor also is another place where ecologically you can have a different uh, set of biology, biology that likes disturbance, and we do have natural disturbance here as we go from our flat sediment rippled seafloor down into Stevens Hole. We have a lot of disturbed seafloor due to both the tides sloshing in and out of that hole and also just due to gravity and natural um, movement of the seafloor. You can note here this is water column data. The orange is your seafloor. The green up here in the water column, that's the turbulence and the moving sediment as we go down into Stevens Hole as it's mixed backwards and forwards by this tidal flow. Now Stevens Passage is actually not inside site 2.3, but geologists don't like to turn their kit off, so we were staying around at uh, the other side of Durville and we had to go through Stevens Passage each day for the survey, so of course we leave our kit on. So we did a small transit as we came back and forth through Stevens Passage, and that highlights for you the rocky, crevice nature of Stevens Passage, high backscatter return, very coarse sediments down there. And of course, high tidal flow, high water turbulence, but a lot of people, these blue cod there, 
because that was also like push any more column as well. Don't show them that. <laughs> and of course, it's an area high in macroalgae on the coastal regions. So what do you do with all this data? We've given you great depth data. We need to take it a, a next step so you can start to work with depth data, and that's a benefit terrain model. What is that? That's us taking the depth, it's taking the backscatter, all the things, slope, rugosity, angle, putting them all together and giving you an indication of what we classify or map that seafloor to be. It's 74% flat plains, it's about 17% uh, broad slopes, about 7% narrow ridges, and 1% of it's made up of all these other features, small depressions, scarps, and the like. What's the average depth there? Um, depth range here, Stevens Hole goes down to over 200 metres, and the top of your sediment waves, just where it's approaching the red, is, is in the order of um, 40 odd. So just zooming in on those, where might you target a, a sampling program to actually look at biodiversity or ecology? You'd want to pick out these regions where you've potentially got complexity in the sea floor. So you might be targeting these rough ridges on the top of your strike ridges. You might be targeting the flat top spines of your sediment waves and also the complexity in between your sediment waves. You would consider looking at the high angle slopes of your sea floor depressions. And you could look at both the flat sea floor and the disturbed, naturally disturbed sea floor. And lastly, as part of this project, we generated a number of graphic images in partnership with Mount Producer Council. You've been given them on your on your desk as part of the Wales <coughs> Medical Waves Information Poster series, uh, which is uh, we use a lot in our engagement with the public and with schools. It gives you a little bit of information about the bathymetry, the depth of sea floor, what you'd expect to find there in terms of biology, and uh, a little bit of information about how we gather the bathymetry. And of course, we have a blue oceanic series, which we put out more as a, a attractive, aesthetic example of the sea floor, and um, they look great framed up. If I can recommend that, um, you can also frame them without the words um, and just have them as a blue aesthetic on your walls. There's also a graphic portfolio, so there's about 54 graphic images of which I've shown a few here today that we've provided across in a portfolio. And the use for that is that where you can delve into those images and pick your sites for future uh, sampling to look at the biology and ecology. And so in summary, there was significant marine site, about 6,000 hectares of the west of Dougal. We used a joint mapping initiative with uh, MDC and NIWA. A variety of these features, geomorphic features, were described uh, your depressions, your ridges, your sediment waves, and they're all classified in the seafloor to give you those flat plains, broad depressions, high slopes, and complex ridges. And we would recommend that those are the features that we would start to look at for a further sampling program. And of course, there's a range of digital products that we hope will help the council engage out in the public sector. And of course, for the project like this, um, it doesn't come cheap. Um, <laughs> we had funding through the MDC and NEWA core funding. We are also fortunate to attract an MB environment grant for this. Uh, title models were run at NEWA and um, it's now NPI, but it was originally under the auspices of the Ministry of Fisheries, uh, allowed us to access the imagery of the seafloor from that region and of course we accessed a lot of NEWA legacy data. So thank you.